Welcome, welcome, welcome. So as I am taping this show, it is 71 glorious degrees outside the 1st of March. March is coming in like a lamb, and perhaps it will be going out like a lion, um, because we have had relatively no winter, no cold days except for a week at Christmas time, no snow, and just very little winter weather. And I think perhaps we are going to have a, a whopper of a snowstorm, I think, sometime in March. But the reminder is just that. See, God is so good. So it comes in like a lamb and out like a lion. That's exactly what God said about Jesus. That Jesus was coming as a lamb, but he was coming back as the lion. He came in as the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's how John the Baptist described Jesus as he saw him coming to get baptized. But we know that Jesus is coming back as the lion from the tribe of Judah. The, just like this month, it's a reminder to me that Jesus is coming back as the lion. See, God just uses all kinds of things in our lives to remind us of who he is and who Jesus is. That God is constantly drawing us back to his word. We're drawing us to a scripture. We're drawing us to him. He is always giving us. In fact, the Bible says that nature has enough evidence for us to know that there is a God. Yeah. And so as I'm sitting here reminding myself <laughs> that soon and very soon, Jesus won't be coming back as the lamb. He's coming back in the fierceness of his wrath as the lion. And so if you know him as the lamb, you will not fear him as the lion. But if you don't know the lamb of God, Jesus, you might be fearful of his second coming and his return because he's coming to judge the world. He's coming back with judgment except for those who know him as the lamb. Because we, the, the lamb's bride, that's what Revelation calls us, is the lamb's bride. We are going to be raptured out before his return to the earth as the lion. So what am I saying? Get to know him as the lamb of God. Accept him as the lamb of God, and you will not fear him as the lion in the tribe of Judah. Hallelujah for the lamb of God who takes away my sin. Oh, I am so grateful that I know the lamb and that I can love the lion. Hallelujah. 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 So I'm in the second week of a seven week series called The Enemy at the Gate. Now, it's the enemy at the gate of our hearts. And if you remember, and I'll remind you each week, that if you should miss one of these, all you have to do is go to our website, brushstrokeministries.com, and click on Video Archive, and all of the TV shows, all of my teachings are on that page. I mean, they go back a couple of years. There are tens and tens and tens and tens of them on the video archive part of our website, brushstrokeministries.com, video archive, and you'll find all the TV shows. So in Deuteronomy, God told Israel that they were to cross over into the promised land and that he had left seven nations for Israel to dispossess. 
Now, God said that he has already overcome them and defeated them, but Israel had a part in playing, a uh, part in, in their victory in dispossessing the seven nations. And then God names those seven nations. So what God revealed to me is those seven nations, those seven enemies are our enemies today. They are the same enemies that we face today. Now understand that Jesus has overcome it all. John 16, 33 says, in this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, have no fear, I've overcome the world. We know that Jesus has overcome sin, death, hell, and the grave. He is victorious over all, but he has left some things for us to dispossess out of us. Sure, it would have been easy when we got saved for God just to take our sin nature or our sin inclination out of us completely, but he didn't. He left it for us to get rid of some things in our lives. But remember, he's given us the Holy Spirit to do that. And so what I'm talking about are the enemies that those seven nations represent. And last week, I talked about the Hittites. And the word Hittite means fear and terror. And I talked about how we operate in fear. Fear of a pandemic, fear of economic disaster, fear of storms, fear of elevators for me, fear of witnessing and sharing the gospel, and terror. You know, we, for, for years we were uh, frightened of the word terror and terrorism, and that still exists in our world, in our days. And so we need to dispossess fear out of our lives. Today, I'm going to talk about the Gergeshites, G-I-R-G-A-S-H-I-T-E-S, -E the Gergeshites. I've called this, I'll take the world. The meaning of the word Gergeshite or Gergesh is one who returns back from a pilgrimage. Now, there's a double meaning, one who turns back from a pilgrimage and then it also means clay dwellers or earthly vessel dwellers. So when you put that name together, and, and God just, he is so faithful to reveal to me things that I could not figure out on my own. When you are on a pilgrimage or you go on a pilgrimage, you are going to something, and I'm going to use it, the, quotations, a religious something, a religious pyramid, pilgrimage. You're going um, to seek something. You're going to seek a God or a God, and you're on a pilgrimage, and you get all warm and fuzzy about the pilgrimage and about your destination and uh, the excitement of, of doing whatever you do on a pilgrimage, and then you come back. You leave the pilgrimage, you leave the excitement of the pilgrimage, and you come back to regular life. Now, you, you think, oh gosh, I would never do that. I, I would say that a lot of us do that on Sunday and Monday. We go to church, our pilgrimage. We go to church and we worship and we sing and we hear the word and we clap our hands and we lift our hands and we pray and we fellowship with believers and we get all excited and warm and fuzzy. And then Monday morning we hit the ground running forgetting about our weekly pilgrimage to church. And we hit the ground back in regular life, back to the earthly life, back to the worldly life. And that, my friends, is a great enemy of believers today. That is a wake-up call that many of us carry the spirit of the Gergashite. Now, they're not enemies anymore, but the spirit of the Gergashite is still our enemy because we are... 
we are, like I said, coming back from a Bible study or a fellowship dinner or something at church or a revival, and we get all excited, and then we go back to regular life, life as normal, life as it was, nothing's really changed in us. We just get back connected to the world, and that's the end of it. Until the next time we go to church or something, and then we do the same thing over and over without really being changed, without the word of God that we hear on Sunday morning making an impact on our lives. We're not living that word out. We're not sharing that word. We're not spreading the gospel. We're not witnessing, not testifying. And some of us aren't even praying throughout the week or worshiping throughout the week. We've become Gergashites. They always looked for things that were tangible, things they could put their hands on. That's why they were clay dwellers. They, they could touch everything and know that it was real. But 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18, 2 Corinthians 4, 18, while we look not at things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary or temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I can't see the important things in my life with my natural eyes. Oh, I can see them with my spirit eyes. But their Gergashites only operate on what they could see, that religious experience that was tangible, the clay dwelling, the earthly things. You see, the spirit of the Gergashite is the spirit of worldliness. Whew. That will cut a lot of us right off. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. Catch us, the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Now, what does that mean? It's the little foxes that come in to destroy the whole vine. Remember, Jesus said he is the vine dresser. He is the vine and, and we're the branches. And that the little fox, that's the little things. It's never huge catastrophes. It's little things like not wanting to go to church on a Sunday or giving up Bible study or I'm too tired to read my Bible tonight. And that turns into the next night or the next Sunday or the next Bible study. And all of a sudden we are distant from God, little foxes that draw our attentions away from God and put it back on earthly things. Let me show you 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Second, 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. And this is Paul, and this is kind of harsh. But he says, and I, Paul, Brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ, fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it, and even now you are still not able for you are still carnal. For where there is envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? Paul says, I would give you so much more teaching. I'd give you so much deeper knowledge of the things of God. But he said, I can't. Because you are so worldly. You are so in love with the world. You are half in the world and half in the kingdom. He said, I, I can barely feed you milk because you are acting like mere men. The last thing I ever want to be accused of is being a mere man or woman. 
I want to be spiritual, spiritually minded, not a mere human. I want to be elevated above my humanity. And the only way I can do that is by turning my back on the humanity and the world and keeping my mind and my eyes focused on God and God alone. The word carnal that Paul used here is translated from this amazing Greek word that literally means fleshly. In this passage, Paul is addressing the readers as brethren, so we know that he is talking to them as Christians, they're believers in God because he calls them brethren, but then he goes on to describe them as worldly, carnal, fleshly. I wonder how many of us are like that, that we are believers, but we have half a foot in the, half our step in the world and half our step in the kingdom. Now, we know this next scripture probably better than most other scriptures, and we take it so out of context. I want to put it back into context. Revelation 3, verses 15 through 17. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot, I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit or spew you out of my mouth. Here's why. Here's the context. Because you say, here's why we are considered lukewarm. Understand, here's why. Because you say, I'm rich. I have become wealthy, and I have need of nothing from God, and do not know that you're really wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. See, Jesus says the reason why you're lukewarm is because you have gathered enough wealth, you have gathered enough comfort prosperity, things in this world that you have no need of God because you don't ever again think of yourself as being miserable, a wretched sinner, poor, blind, or naked. That's an indictment against that Gergashite spirit that we become so worldly, we can accumulate so much our comfort is so great that we don't remember that we are nothing but wretched sinners. And the penalty of our sin should be death, but for the blood of Christ. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is not comfort or half in, half out. The wages of our sin is death. The spirit of compromise, that lukewarm. Webster's defines compromise as doing something midway. And that's how I feel that we are in the church. We are carnally minded midway, midway in God, midway sold out to God, uh, midway back in the world. That Gergashite spirit is a powerful lure for a lot of us. We've heard it. You don't need to be radical. You don't need to be fanatical and extreme about Jesus. Just kind of keep it between you and God. Or you don't want to offend anybody. Let's just kind of keep your faith quiet. It's not at all what God says. Listen, if you're willing to raise your hands at a football game, you ought to be able to raise your hands in church. If you are able to clap at a football or a basketball game, you need to clap for the Lord and give him a clap offering in church. That's the hot part of Revelation, hot or cold. Cold would be to sit there in church like this, like with your arms crossed, like... 
not listening, falling asleep, thinking about other things, playing on your phone. That's the cold. And he says there's somewhere in between that he doesn't like. First John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. First John chapter 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. John doesn't get any clearer than that. God says that none of that is from him. He says it's not from the Father, but it's from the world. That Gergashite spirit that is drawing us home from a pilgrimage to become clay dwellers or earthly dwellers or worldly dwellers. The devil doesn't want us to have a passion for God. And the opposite of passion is apathy. And so the devil is going to do everything he can to get you back in the world because sin robs us of God. Our passion for God. And that is Satan's ploy. It's what he did with Adam and Eve. You can choose the tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they chose not the life of God, but the mere knowledge of God, the things of God, and not the life of God. Satan got Eve to look on that tree. Now, she had seen that tree hundreds of times because she had been in the garden. But Satan got her to gaze at that tree, the pride and the desire of the eyes. And he made her look at that tree and think, mm, that apple does look pretty good. And the longer she looked at it, the longer she gazed at it, the more she forgot about God's promise and the more she went for the apple. That's us today. Satan is showing us shiny apples all around. And the more we look upon those shiny apples, the less we remember about God's promise, the less we remember about the penalty of sin that Jesus paid for us. And then we become lukewarm, and then we become Gergashites. Romans 12, 2, we know the scripture so well. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds that you might discern the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Good and acceptable and perfect. Nothing in the world is good and acceptable and perfect. Only the things of God are good and acceptable and perfect. Oh, we need the things of this world. We need houses and cars and food and beds. And well, we might not need beds, but we need the necessities of life. That's not what we're talking about with the Gergashite spirit. We're talking about having the mindset of the world, having the same reactions as the world, the same kind of actions as the world. We should be the ones that let someone butt in front of us at Walmart instead of griping about them. Or if someone cuts us off, we go, I'm going to pray for that person because if they're that reckless, I, I need to pray that they don't hurt anybody in Jesus' name or even themselves in Jesus' name. That's how... A believer responds, not with anything vile or vulgar. Yet many of us respond vulgarly or vilely 
Why? That person is on his way, doesn't even remember that he cut you off five miles down the road. You are forgotten, but you are still stewing about it. I have friends who are like that. Not so much anymore as they used to be. It might creep up every once in a while. But that's the drawl of the world, to draw us back into its chaos. James 4.4, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Self-explanatory. But let me give you just one more. Matthew 6.24, Matthew 6.24. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money or God and the things of this world. So where does that leave us? It should leave us with a passion for God, a hunger for his word, a desire for his presence and nothing that this world can offer is worth giving that up for. So I caution us to dispossess that Gergashite spirit, that spirit of worldliness, that carnality, that fleshly part of us. Get it out. Ask God to cleanse you from that spirit, to get rid of that spirit and to live wholly and passionately for him. He loves us with a jealous love, not like jealous we know it, but with a wonderful godly jealousy. So if you do not know this Jesus, will you let us lead you to him? Because he is painting a picture of your life with him together, but it's one brushstroke at a time, and he loves doing it. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brushstroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.